Welcome to the Delvin Cox Experience, the podcast which each week I am on a one-man mission to unite our culture through diversity. I'm your host, Delvin Cox, and with me this week on a podcast, I have a special guest. Let him know who you are, brother. Appreciate that warm-up and that introduction. My name is Sheldon Allen. You can find me at, at Sheldon Wrote It. I am an author. I'm pretty outspoken on all topics. Pretty annoying sometimes. But, you know, at least you know it's genuine and it's sincere, so. Nothing, nothing wrong with that at all, brother. Nothing wrong with that. Welcome to the experience. As always, we like to start the podcast off with the five for five. Five questions, five answers to get the ball rolling. Sheldon, are you ready? I'm ready, bro. Let's do it. All right. Question number one. Best album or song you listened to the past year, and it does not have to be new. Ooh, best album that I have listened to in the past year. Man, I'm so glad you said it does not have to be new. So I've been on like this little scavenger hunt. And so I listened to the Curtis Mayfield Superfly album. That's a good album. It is, you know, we overuse the word masterpiece. That is a masterpiece. That is a masterpiece. And it doesn't get any better than that. Pick a song up there. You can't just limit it to just one. So um, I'm I'm, going to rock with Superfly. I like that answer. I like that answer. All right. Question number two. And this is a hot topic, so I definitely wanted to ask you about this. I'm ready. Dipset or the locks? Oh, my goodness, man. Listen, <laughs> Dipset has so much material in their catalog to compete, but what they did was just borderline unprofessional. I actually made a tweet about it uh, earlier today. So you look at the whole little uh, segment with Welcome to New York versus New York, right? And no universe is Welcome to New York. I mean, an inferior song to New York. Welcome to New York is one of the best rap songs about New York ever written. And yet, in that, in that moment, at that time, New York cleared it. So, you, you gotta go with the locks. It, it, it's the locks. Dipset was borderline unprofessional last night. I, I, I was kind of disgusted, to be honest with you. It was, and I, I love both groups, and I agree uh, with you. Welcome to New York, New York City is one of my favorite rap songs ever. The production is insane. It's, it's, it's insane. One of the best Cam One verses I've ever heard. Bar none. And if you look at the backdrop for the song, too, it's even better because this was at the time when allegedly Jay, he had a little bit of, he had, he had a bit of issue with Cam signing to The Rock. Yes. You know, they had a little bit of beef. Is he going to appear on the album? Is he not going to appear on the album? And then the album comes out, Welcome to New York City, and you're like, what dimension is this song from? They both rose to the occasion. Yeah, and I and I love the New York song too as well. I think that was a great song, but that's a Ja Rule mm-hmm. song. That's a Ja Rule joint. It was right. great. It's a great song, but I if I had to put both of those together, nine out of ten times I'm picking "Welcome to New York City" because that was just a doper song for me. And uh, that dip set locks versus was just wild in all forms of fashion. I think that um. What, what I got from it was that that boy Jadakiss has a heck of a catalog. Jadakiss catalog, Jadakiss stock is definitely on the rise. So it's not, you know, Jadakiss's catalog is, is it's legit, but, you know, no disrespect to him. It's not a top 10 catalog, but he's got so much swag and confidence and charisma that you would think it's a top 10 catalog. I, yeah, I think I can agree with that. I think it's 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 close. I think it's really close. Uh, if you look at all the features and stuff he's done, and the stuff he's written, because I forgot that he wrote a lot of puff and big stuff. I'm like, holy crap, I forgot he wrote that. And got like, he got hits, man. He he you know, If I were to put it in basketball terms, he's kind of like AI. You know, Allen like Iverson. Everybody, like there's a whole bunch of people who love Allen Iverson. Allen Iverson is their favorite player. But Allen Iverson never won a championship or things like mm-hmm. that where you can see on paper, you you can see why people wouldn't pick Allen Iverson as their favorite player, but Allen Iverson is that dude. I'm, I, I can dig the comparison. It's, it's a legitimate comparison. Okay, definitely. Question number three. What is the dumbest thing you ever done as a kid, Sheldon? Ooh, dumbest thing I ever did as a kid was lie to my mom. I should have known better. And I lied to her about something stupid because she worked in the school system. 
And so she knows when report cards are coming out and she knows when the progress reports were coming out. So she asked me, um, this was in sixth grade, she, uh, if my progress report had came out. And, you know, I, I generally, generally I had pretty good grades. Um, I, you know, I was an AB student, but man, pre-algebra was killing me in sixth grade because, you know, you're kind of sort of on your own for the first time and nobody's, you know, carrying you like you're used to the elementary school. And so I hid it from her. And she asked me if I had it. And I said, no, of course she knew I was lying. She set me up. You know how black parents are. Yes. And, um, <laughs> let's just say that was a, that was a memorable whooping, you know, not because only whooping, <laughs> but it, it was pretty memorable. I still think about it uh, to this day, actually. So yeah, just, just lied to my mom. That was pretty stupid. Yeah, we, we got to keep it a 100. People know this. If you grew up in a black home and you're of a certain age, I want to say 30 and up. Uh-huh. <laughs> you, you knew the whoopings were coming. It's not like it was yeah. a secret. Like the belts and whoopings were a common occurrence in yeah, black households. And, and you know, I had I had I, I'm the youngest, so I had older siblings. So, you know, that was the you know, that was a prime time viewing for the evening, you know, watching your siblings <laughs> getting that whooping and uh then they clown you later when it's over. So Yeah, that is that is a fact. That is a fact. All right. Question number four. If you could write a script for any movie you want, what would that movie be? Okay, so this is, you got to frame this question correctly. So if you ask me that, I'm going to say I want to write my own script. So I think probably what you're trying to get at, if I can write you, one for an existing property, is that what you're trying to say? You can, you, I, if you want to write your own script, I will hear, you give me a 20 second, well, Never mind, don't do that. Because I want people to steal your idea. Let's do, let's go do existing property. Because I don't well, want yeah, we'll, 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 we'll do existing properties, man. Listen, I, I I'm an unabashed Star Wars geek. I would love to write something Star Wars. I would love to do something Star Wars. And you know, without even just giving the story idea away or like where I would want to go, I think. I would move away from the Jedi stuff. If you look at the best Star Wars stuff that's come out the last couple of years, the most solid Star Wars stuff, it really has nothing to do with the Jedi. So that universe is so rich for exploration, and, and I would just love to do something Star Wars based. Um, and then, of course, if, if I did have to do some, something Jedi based, I would like to do a Darth Vader solo film. I think that would be pretty dope, too. Okay. Let me ask this question to, to add All on right. to that. Would it be with characters that we know from the universe, or would you like to do like Dave Filoni did and create your own characters and build your own universe? All new. Okay. All, All new. Good. All new from scratch. All new from scratch. Although I do have this crazy, stupid, silly idea, I think it will work, actually. So I was, you know, I, I, I've probably seen Star Wars, the, the original, probably more than almost any other film. It, it, it's it's up there. It definitely ranks in my top five. The I first one, crazy, yeah, the first one. Okay. Um, it probably was. It probably used to be Return of the Jedi when I was a kid, because you know kids like Return of the Jedi. And it was Empire Strikes Back as you get older, and then it's Star Wars because my mom, that she's the one who introduced me to it, and she used to always say, "Oh, you know, the, the first one's the best one, New Hope. That's the best one." So no, it's Empire Strikes Back. And the older I get, I feel like I'm coming around more to my mom's opinion that the first one was the best one, a New Hope. And so I watched it, and I'm like, this is, like, a great film. Like, almost every trope of any type of action-adventure movie post-Star Wars borrows simply from Star Wars, that structure. And yeah. my thing was just watching it, I was like, you know, this is a great film, but, you know, it, 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 started, it started to show a little bit of age. So I was like, you know, it would be great if they could just make, like, an entire just, like, Mini series of the original trilogy and the prequels, but they just recast it, right? And it just got really crazy with the recast. So, like, what if Luke Skywalker was a black dude, for example? And um, you know, just 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 this brand new cast and the same stories, the you know, the same structure and everything. And I just had that crazy idea. I think it'd be pretty cool, uh, especially for the younger kids as well, this, this new generation. Because again, the the film is still amazing, but it, but it is starting to show its age a little bit. That's actually not a bad idea at all. Now that I think about it, I yeah, never thought crazy. about that till you said it. Yeah, and then and then kind of be like, kind of just like non non just non logical or nonsensical with it. So like Luke Skywalker could be a black guy, 
but who's to say Darth Vader, his father, he could be a white guy. Like, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be logical. You know what I'm saying? You could you just do it. Cast him. You could do it like the new 52. You can kind of just reboot the whole universe and do what you right. want to do with that universe. And you can tweak little things. I kind of like that idea, actually. I think it would be amazing. It would actually make sense to me now that I think about it. Like, hey, we, we're going to reboot the whole universe. We're going to recast everybody. And honestly speaking, now probably would have been the perfect time to do that. When, <laughs> it, when, trust me, it would have. It would have, believe me. Considering everything that's going on with Star Wars in terms of how people now like, well, current Star Wars at least, people enjoy the shows more than they do the movies. Right. Like, you know, people love The Mandalorian, people enjoy Rebels, people like um, The Clone Wars, uh -huh. the TV series, and the movies, well, they're mixed, to say the least. It's a mixed bag. Yeah, trust me, it, it'll work. It lend the 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 prequels and the the, the original trilogy. It, they lend themselves to that type of format, and you can do a little bit more deep exploration on certain little pivots here and there. Um, it, it, it'll work. Trust me. Okay. Question number five, mm -hmm. and this is everybody's favorite question: Zombie apocalypse is happening, Walking Dead style. Mm -hmm. You can take five things to go out in the world to survive. Anything you want, Sheldon. Okay. What are you taking to survive? Pets and family don't count because they automatically are going with you unless you're uh -huh. going to kill them yourself. <laughs> right, right. Okay. So I'm getting me some antibiotics, biotics, some amoxicillin. Okay. I um, like that. Yeah, I give me some, some sort of antibiotics. I'm definitely taking me some sort of blade, some type of sharp object of some sort. Okay. Um, we talking machete or like um sword or nah, something, so, like so, something something smaller, something smaller, uh, something smaller, um, lighter, some lighter fluid. I'm gonna cheat and count that as one. Okay, I'll allow that. <laughs> lighter, lighter fluid. I'm gonna count that as one. I'm definitely taking a pistol of some sort. I don't need like a huge heavy machine gun or like a shotgun or anything like that. Well, <laughs> I had somebody on. One of the previous episodes said he wants a giant, like, machine gun. I'm like, how are you going to – you're not going to last too long. You're going to need bullets eventually. He's like, nah, right, right. I just want the biggest gun I can find. Yeah, and I'm going to take a spare uh, spare, spare uh, pair of shoes, I would say, would be my fifth one. You are this just – this is, all say, assuming, this is all assuming I have a backpack, right? Is Does that count as an item, the backpack? Or the backpack, backpack does not like count as an item. I will not okay. count that as an item. Okay, and, okay. You may be the second person I've heard say, I'll take a pair of shoes. Yeah, I'll take a, a spare pair of shoes. That's actually a good idea. Yeah. I'm trying to think who else said that. Somebody else said that. Well, you're going to be doing a lot of running. You're going to be doing a lot of walking over things. You, I mean, you never know. Me, personally, I think of the zombie apocalypse. I'm gonna sit my ass down. Excuse my language. I'm 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 gonna chill. I'm not gonna be walking around and running around if I don't have to. I'm gonna try to stay put for the most part. If I have to be mobile, then okay, that's where the spare pair of shoes come in. Well, let me ask this extra question then. Uh -huh. You ain't gotta give any details. Do you think mm -hmm. your place is fit for a zombie apocalypse? Like, let's say, like I said, Walking Dead style. Uh -huh. and, you're in, and you're in a house that's secure enough where you're like, you know, like I can still, I can chill here and I'll be okay. Or you're like, nah, I got to get out of here. I think I can, my place is set after like the first initial wave or whatever, which probably wouldn't even be that bad with where I am. I, I, I'll do all right. Okay. I like that. I, I, I would do all right. I, I it always. Would be, it would be, it would be a real walking dead situation where the zombies wouldn't be my problem. It would be my fellow humans who aren't zombies who would be okay. my issue. That I, that that would be the trouble in that situation. I tell people all the time that where I stay at is the perfect place if uh -huh. the zombie apocalypse happens because it's a two story building, right? And I just stay with my family that has right, shutters. Right. Like like I'm in the office part right now that has shutters so nobody can get in. It has a big security gate. Right, and it's right. only us here, so you really can't get in unless you. Have a grenade and blow up, blow up in the front door. Yeah, I'd I, I, I be sad. I'd be pretty sad. Okay, I like that. I like that. So, Sheldon, let them know a little bit about yourself for those who don't know. So, uh, again, my name's Sheldon. 
Um, find me at, at Sheldon Rodin on all social media. I am a writer, uh, primarily of comic books. Uh, right now, I'm writing for Scout Comics. I'm on my third series with them. My first series was a book called Crucified. Second one was a book called uh, Concrete Jungle. And then the one I'm writing right now, the current one, which is going to be released next month, is called Snatch. Um, so, you know, I'm just trying to do creative, independent, original comics. Not necessarily superhero comics. Don't get me wrong, I love superhero comics. I adore superhero comics. Um, I'm just trying to, you know, tell different types of stories that you wouldn't normally see in the comic book medium in that format, which is something that I grew up with, something that I cherish. So I'm just trying to introduce readers into, you know, just different types of myths, if, if we could use that word. I, I will say this. Snatch feels like the, the movies in the early 90s, uh, in eight, late 80s that I used to watch, like New Jack City, and stuff like that it has that feel to it. I like it a lot because it's not your typical comic book story where you have the big superhero going into battle, or it's kind of like Narcos a little bit. I like it. First of all, that was the ultimate compliment, and you don't even really know me, but New Jack City is one of my all time favorite films. So, there you go. In, in, in type of comparison to that, I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna rock with it, I'm gonna rock with it. But um, yeah, I just like that little punk rock feeling to my books. Um, even with my other books, you know, I like to just kind of do something that, you know, if you just see it laying on my coffee table, you'll pick it up and you'll, you know, of course, you, you know, just curiosity has you pick it up, any type of comic book, and you, so you just flip through it most times. But I like for my books to be like, all right, if you flip through it, you're going to stop and you're going to like maybe go back. You're going to actually like read this thing because it's something that you don't. You know, you're not, you, you haven't seen before, but it's something that's kind of sort of familiar, but it's presented in a way to you that's kind of sort of just like in your face. I like that rebel type of feel to the comic books. Like, I feel like if, if I was a kid and I was reading comics, like I would want to hide my comics from my parents, you know, that that's the way I try to write. Um, that's Those are types of stories that I try, that I try to tell. That's a perfect explanation for because I feel like that's what that's kind of is. It's kind of the book that you put behind the Captain America book. Mm -hmm. So you don't want you to know, let your parents know that you're reading this as well. Like, yeah, Captain America is cool, but also we got this really dark, violent comic book that's really about the streets and the environments that young black kids in the inner city grew up so, kind of seeing a little bit of, of and kind of watching those movies and things like that. I like the concept of it and things like in, of this comic, and it's like it feels like it could be a movie, mm -hmm. and that is really cool. And I also appreciate to add a little bit more to it that. Scout Comics is doing excellent in terms of having stories like Black Cotton mm -hmm. that's telling one specific story. Then you got Snatch telling a whole different story. And they both work. And it's, they're both things that we don't get from the Marvels, the DCs, the Image. And it's cool to see Scouts kind of giving us those stories. And you got to give props to Scout Comics as well, too. Like, you know, I, I love them as a publisher and I love how they support me. Um, I don't think they'll say, take what I'm about to say as an insult, but it's, it's a compliment to them. That's why I say you have to give them props. Yeah, yeah. think about it. The, the, the publishers and the partners, it's, it's a bunch of, you know, it's a bunch of white guys. It's not, it's, you know, it's no, it's no minorities. It's a bunch of white guys, but they're open-minded enough to accept these stories and to understand these stories and to want to publish these stories and put these stories out there for other people to consume. And, um, credit to them also they enjoy the stories as as well too so you know not many people you know who aren't like you or, 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 or look like you are willing to do that you know they kind of stay within that bubble that insular little circle and you know if something's unfamiliar to them or something that's is foreign to them you know they sort of just reject it and um that's one thing i appreciate with scouts since i've been working with them that they've been open to everything that i've been publishing everything that i've been putting out to them so uh Kudos to them. I, I give them all the props in the world. Yeah, definitely. I think that it's fascinating that one that you got to do these things with Scout because usually when you when comic books are discussed and people talk discuss about making comic books, it's always like, okay, who's a superhero mm -hmm. that you're doing or a super villain? And I, I feel like we had a period where we moved away from superheroes and super villains with stuff like The Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. But then we kind of went right back to superheroes and things like that. Right. So it's good to see 
other stories being told by people like you and Rodney Barnes doing Philadelphia. It, I think it's dope. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's why, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to get on my high course and I'm not trying to lose anybody. Trust me. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not trying to preach. So don't think I'm trying to preach, but that's why diversity is important in, 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 in any medium, because you're going to get those different stories. You're going to get those different viewpoints. And um, even, even if, it, if it comes to a, a, a superhero, you know, you're going to get a different perspective. And we get those different perspectives, that just leads to better storytelling, that, that leads to more originality, that leads to more creativity. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what we all want as consumers, I think. So, um, you know, I, again, I, I, I can't give Scout Thomas credit enough, at least for, you know, that aspect of being open to that. Yeah, and like give them credit on the fact that they're kind of on the ground level of it in terms of we're kind of seeing a renaissance in comic books in terms of especially with black creators mm -hmm. like Tanahashi Coates is writing Captain America now. Right. Went from writing Black Panther to Captain America, which a few years back is unheard of. Right. We got Rodney Barnes doing Philadelphia. We got you doing the things you're doing. I think it's great that we have these, and now milestones bringing back Icon mm -hmm. out of all things. So, you know, it's cool to see that we're getting so much diversity in comics now, and it feels like this should have been something that's happening happened years ago, maybe even decades ago. Yeah, it, it's, it should have happened, but, you know, as long as it's happening now, you know, that's the way you got to look at it. So, you know, at least, at least it is happening now. Um, it's just such a small insular circle, especially the comics book before. It's, it's such an insular circle. It's such a small group of people. And um, it, it, it's real easy for, for folk to be left out. Um, so, you know, you just got to sort of just expand your horizon. I think that's what a lot of publishers are doing. I think that's what a lot of editors are doing. Um, they're not... I won't say that they're searching or going out of their way to look for certain things. I just think that they just broaden how they accept things and, and, and get submissions and, and who are they taking it from. And so that, and, and, and also more important, who's looking at this stuff? You know, I hate to use that buzz term, that buzz word, gatekeepers, but you know, who are the gatekeepers? You know, we had new gatekeepers now. We have gatekeepers who are more modern. We have gatekeepers who grew up in different type of environment, different type of atmosphere, different type of world, different type of America. So they recognize certain things that maybe the ones of the past wouldn't be able to recognize. So, you know, it, it all it, it all works hand in hand. And, um, you know, it's not something that is perfect. It's not something that's anywhere where it needs to be, but at least, you know, it is happening. So let, let me ask you this. How did you come up with the concept of this comic book? Let's okay, get, let's so, get to that. Yeah. Yeah. So for those, we well, first of all, let's just briefly say what the, the concept is about snatch. It's about the world of illegal hair trafficking. So, you know, those weaves and those those lace fronts that that hair comes from somewhere. Yes. Um, and so snatch tells a story about, you know, the the, the not so pleasant place where it came where it came from. And um, I got the idea for it a couple of years ago. Uh, I've told this story before, you know. Listen, you know the outsized importance that hair plays, you know, in a woman's life, particularly a black woman's life. So yes. essential. I, I spent quite a bit of time in the weave store, the hair store. Uh, with my girlfriends back in the day and you know there's not much for a guy to do in the hair store except for just wander around and just sort of marvel at the prices of these hair packs and, and you know all these different like chemicals and hair products and everything like that it's just canyons of hair products so I'm just wandering around and just looking at it and you know I did this sort of hidden like I was like well, you know where where's this stuff even coming from like who, who was creating this how is stuff even getting here so that's where that first seed was playing and just spending a whole lot of time in hair salons and hair stores and, um, you know, just being bored, trying to entertain myself. And uh, I was like, you know, this would be a pretty good story. Like, what if this, this hair is actually coming in from humans, but it's they're not voluntarily giving it up. You know, they're getting it through different means, whether it's from dead people or, you know, people who, who, who are being trafficked themselves. 
And uh, that's what that seed, that, that was the initial seed. And then it just sort of just grew from there and it just blossomed and just metastasized. And, you know, we got snatched now. One of the things that kind of stand out to me when you first see the cover of the book is just how it looks and the, the splash of red with the clippers in the white background. It's just so cool. I, did, did you come up with that concept with the, um, the artist or is that just like, hey, just do what you think it works? So this is my little pitch to any artist who might be watching it or listening to this. Like, I'm probably one of the easiest writers to work with in that I write, I have specific dialogue, I have specific descriptions of what I want to happen in the scene and on the page. But I'm really loose. I let the artists do their thing for the most part. Um, you know, if it's something story-wise, I'm like, okay, this this has to be there because we're going to come back to that later. You know, I'll say something. But for the most part, I let the artists do their thing. I don't, you know, I don't give too much input on certain things like that. The covers, every cover that you've ever seen from any of my books, that's for me. The, the cover concepts are all me. So I will take credit for the cover on that one. Um, I'll take, let me correct myself, I'll take credit for the idea of the cover. The actual execution, of course, is by the artist. But uh, yeah, I, I remember I initially told him the concept of, you know, it's just some clippers, and a pair of scissors covered in blood, and, you know, we have, like, some little strands of hair around there. And he's like, yeah, yeah, okay, I got it, I got it. And our artist, Maurice, Mauricio, he's from Argentina, so I was kind of, I was kind of a little worried that maybe he wouldn't understand some of the concepts or some of the things that, that we were trying to do, especially in some of the urban scenes. But it, it, it's just an eye-opening experience working with people from other countries because you see just how globalized of the world that we really are. Um, and he was able to pick up on, on a ton of those things just from, you know, the shows that he watched and then the, the, the sporting events that he watched. And I'm like, wow, you, like, you watch Atlanta? They have Atlanta in South America? <laughs> That's why yeah, I yeah, think about it. Yeah, well, yeah, it's in it's on Netflix. I'm like, wait, Atlanta's on Netflix in South America? So it's just crazy, you know, how it's a big world, but it's a small world at the same time. Yeah. Let's let's take it back a little bit. What first got you into writing? I always just like the idea of storytelling and and and, and just telling tales. Um but I would probably say it was my older brother, because my older brother, he used to kind of just write stories on his own. So, you know, like most younger brothers, I just copy a lot of the stuff that my older brother did. So he read comic books, I'm going to read comic books. He writes stories, I'm going to write stories. And so I just started, like, writing stories. Um, it's kind of funny. Like, most people, they start out kind of sort of writing some variation of fan fiction, like, Spider-Man comic or whatever, you know, the X-Men comic. I always kind of sort of wrote my own original stories. Um, first, you know, I would write it on a little line paper, the little notepads like that. When I first got the computer, I would write them. Um, but yeah, I just always love telling stories. Um, my family, we always watch films. Um, we always read. So we always watch TV shows. We had a certain TV shows that we watched together. Um, we used to watch Star Trek The Next Generation together. That was our one show that we used to watch. I don't think my dad was too pleased with it, but at least he sat there and pretended to enjoy it because <laughs> at least my brother and I, we liked it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I just love telling stories and, and, and just seeing the audience reactions and, and just kind of just seeing what their expectations are and seeing how, you know, they look when it plays out a certain way. Okay. So how did you translate that into writing comics? Because I don't think, when I think of writers, I don't normally think of, hey, I can write comic books. You think of people writing these long, big books that people you see in libraries. Are like You don't think like of cool things like comic book things like that or graphic novels for that matter. Right, yeah. So uh, I, the first stuff, things I really started writing, it was probably uh, movies, screenplays. Okay. Or what I thought were screenplays. That makes sense. Plays. Yeah. So that that's why I initially started writing. But the thing is, I this when I really started getting into writing, I really wasn't messing with comic books like that. I kind of was like, you know, I kind of fell out of love with them a little bit. I had a little bit of burnout at that point. Um, so I got back into comics thanks to Grant Morris's new X Men and the Ultimates. Um, and I was like, wow, this is this is great. Like this is like this is totally different than the comic books that I'm used to or that you know that I, I normally used to read. 
So I was like, you know, let me let me try my hand at this. So that's when I first started reading comic books, not reading comics, but writing comic books. That's when I got back into comic book writing or started comic book writing, I should say. And um, it was a transition from the screenplay. And the thing about comic books is that, you know, when you're writing the screenplay, they tell you, you read anything in my screenplay, they always say, you know, don't think about outside factors like budget or whatever, just write your story. But of course, you're, th you're, you're thinking of things like budget. So it's like, you know, I can't put this scene in here or I can't do this. This movie's going to cost $300 million. If somebody, you know, they're never going to want to make it. Well, with a comic book, you don't have a budget. You have an unlimited budget as far as what goes on the page or as far as what the audience sees. And so that was a real big attraction for me as far as comic books go. Like I can write anything and you're only limited by your imagination. I think that's one of the coolest aspects of comic books for that matter. I think that having the freedom to write and draw what you want mm -hmm. and putting it out there to people and comic books don't take as long as movies to make. Right. You know, you know, movies take years. They, when I say years, some cases four or five years. Comic book takes. I don't. Well, let's hear from you. Let's hear from you. I'm not the comic expert. So it's, it's so. There's a lot to unpack there. Making actual comic book production, yes, it takes. It's not comparable to a movie, but publishing a comic book—that's a whole different story. But the actual craft of making a, a comic book, it can happen fairly quickly. Um, although, man, movies, they've, they've caught up, man. These movies are like a machine. Yeah, especially now. They've got that that, this, that little Atlanta little meat market they have up there just, just churning out movies and, and, and television shows up there in Atlanta, like an assembly line. It, it's crazy, man. Yeah, when you think about it, as opposed to what it was back in the day. Mm-hmm. Movies are coming out relatively way faster. Like we've had what 10, 12 years of Marvel now, uh -huh. a little over that, and, and we've gotten countless amounts of movies. It's like every other year. It's the entitlement factor that I, bl I blame cell phones. You know, we have everything at the tip of, of, of our fingertips, right? We have everything there. We want everything right now, right now, right now, right now, or else we're gonna start looking true. for the next thing. So these guys are cognizant of it. The, the powers that be, they're cognizant of these things. So, you know, they they know, like, we got to get this stuff out here or else they're going to sort of move on to something else. We got to kind of keep their attention somehow, some way. You brought up a really good point just now. I, I should bring up to you right now. How do you, as a, a comic book writer, mm -hmm. contend with that in terms of like, okay, you're writing the story. And yeah, you're doing it fast because it's a comic book, but you have to keep it fresh so you don't lose people. Because this generation, real short attention spans. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep the story fresh to make them stick around to get issue two, issue three, and so forth and so on? Man, I'm going to say something that somebody's probably never said on your show before, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I try my best, you know, you try to create captivating characters or captivating uh, scenarios, environments, the stories, so hopefully they will want to come back. That's your hope and, and, you know, that's your aim. But man, if I had a secret formula in which I said, this is how you do it, I wouldn't be writing comics. I would be selling that, that secret formula to people and I'd be on vacation somewhere because it, it would be that lucrative. Yeah, because it's a different time now because a lot of people even with TV shows, you may have one or two episodes at most that catch a person's attention and then mm -hmm. they're gone. If you don't catch... It's just the overload of media and it's not just the the the, the quantity of, of choices that people have. It's, it's, it's also a little thing like editing as well. So I was talking about Star Wars earlier, right? So I remember one time I was teaching a class and this, this was a middle school class. And I showed them Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. This was about, this was 2012. Great movie. And these kids were falling asleep on <laughs> Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. They were falling asleep. And I'm like, okay, you can't really say it looks dated. The cinematography is still great. And the film takes place in the 30s. So you can't really say, you know, it's about like what they're wearing. It's a period film. And I, 
I realized that, you know, it's the editing, like, you know, shots linger on a person for more than like three or four or five seconds before it switches to something else. And a lot of the films and the TV shows that, that the kids watch today, you know, it's got like that fast paced editing, which is cool too. I love the fast paced editing as well, but that's kind of what they're accustomed to. So, it, it, you know, it's, it's not just the, the, the abundance of, of, of stuff that they have that they could choose from. It's also just the way that it's made and presented to them. Yeah, you got a good point with that because um, cartoons nowadays kind of do the same thing in terms of when I was coming up, mm -hmm. cartoon episode for 22 minutes right. without, co without commercial stuff like that. And mm -hmm. you get like, a, it'd be like one topic. Now right. you have shows like, especially particularly a cartoon. I guess both networks, both cartoon networks do it. Cartoon Network and they do it. Episodes of each episode of a cartoon is ten minutes now. Right. And then they show they just show two episodes because kids' attention spans are so short. Uh -huh. They can't. They don't want to stick around if the episode is longer than ten minutes. So they kind right. of just like, hey, you can watch this ten minute episode, then you can come back and watch the other ten minute separate episode. That's how almost every show is now. Yeah, it's just how everything has to be presented to them. You have to present it to them in little chunks. It's almost like they're, they're you know, they're being spoon-fed just, and it's not even like they're being spoon-fed like uh, uh, the good portions of the of the meal. They're being spoon-fed like just sugar and like, <laughs> you know, glucose and fructose and stuff that's just like getting them hype. Like everything's just like in their face and just like bright and flashy and just like loud and, you know, that. That's what they're consuming. That's what their eyes are taking in. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting thing that I didn't really think about till you just brought it up just now. That how we now consume media in a completely different way that that we consumed before. I'm happy to see that. In a strange way, that benefits comic books because comic books, the way they're written. You can kind of get through the story fast, and it makes you mm -hmm. want want more of that issue, like your your story. It's a it's a fast read, but it makes you want to see okay, what where the story going for to? Right, it makes you question okay, who should I be rooting for in this story? Right, right. I, I like so, that aspect of it, and I like that you kind of put it out there. Like, for one, I don't want to I don't want to spoil the book. Uh -huh. I want people to go read Snatch and, and for themselves to go check it out, but. The intro to this book is shocking. Right. In terms of what happens, it reminds me of, like, I'll go back to it again. One of the scenes in New Jack City. Uh huh. And then it just takes a left turn. I'm like, holy crap, I didn't expect that. And I like that aspect of it. It keeps you on your toes and stuff. So, what was your idea when you were coming up with the concept of that first scene in particular? You ain't got to spoil it or nothing like that, but. Well, it was kind of, you, you kind of sort of hit it on the head, like, okay, well, where are you going with this scene? Yeah, I, I, I've seen, I've seen scenes like this before. I know scenes like this exist in real life for specific reasons, like, you know, what's going to happen next? And then it happens when it happens in the book, you know, you have this little explosion of, of, of violence that just kind of sort of comes out of nowhere. And then you see where it ultimately ends up. So I just wanted to sort of play with expectations a little bit, kind of just set the tone for the book. Like you don't know what to expect. Anything can happen in this book. It's not going to be a traditional type of storytelling. It's not going to be a traditional type of, okay, A, B, C, D, and then so on and so forth. Like you don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know how, it's going to end up, you don't know how we're going to get to an ultimate resolution on this first volume. And I want to go back to what you said about, you said you don't know who to root for. And I'm glad you said that because I've always said with any of my books that I've read, with the exception of a Spider-Man book I wrote years ago for Marvel, I don't, I, I never really think about things in terms of good guys and bad guys. I kind of sort of let the audience choose who should be the person that they root for, the person that they get behind. I always like writing about gray areas because I feel like that's how, you know, the world is for, you know, not to be too dark, but that's how the world is for the most part in that, you know, good is just a, it's, it's a matter of perspective. Not for everybody, of course. We have genuine saints out there like, wow, this is an amazing person. But for the most part, you know, good is a matter of perspective. Bad is a matter of perspective. So that's kind of like the 
the atmosphere that I like to exist in. Um, I like to I like to delve into those corners of just humanity in general. Uh, but I like to do it in a kind of I don't want to say lighthearted way, but I like to kind of do it in a humorous way. You know, I'm not trying to depress anybody. I'm not trying to make anybody, you know, to say, you know, I hate everybody and everything. You know, I try to do it in a way that's fun and entertaining. So. Uh, and I, I like what you're doing with that. So this is not a, I guess it's kind of a silly question. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to take it from here with Snatch? Do you want to build a universe with it? Do you want to tell a singular story? How, how, like, I'm trying to avoid spoiler, but how do you? Uh, it is a to, singular story. How do you story? envision this? Yeah, it, it, it's a singular story. We have multiple volumes uh, that we'll be doing. Um, there's a beginning, there's a middle, and there is an end. There's a definite end uh, for the book. Uh, so wow. this is what's happening right now. This is just, you know, that first portion. This is just the introduction to that universe. And um, I will say this, where Snatch begins and where Snatch ends are two very different places. Uh, but that thread is going to be there that connects them all. And that that strand, no, you know, no pun intended, is going to remain. And so you're going to see the trails from where it began. You're going to see how it originated from there. You're going to be able to see the evolution. But if you were to just pick up the first issue and then you pick up the last issue whenever that shit drop, you go, wow, this is, this is two separate books. That's dope. I like I like that idea. I like that concept of you coming into a book, starting the character at one place, then you ending in a completely different place. That's a, that's a dope idea. I like that a lot. So let me yeah, ask you about this. Do you see this becoming more than just a comic book? Um, you know, my question—I—I I, I do get that question a lot for a lot of my properties. And listen, of course, I would love for these books to become a movie and a TV show. I—I I, I would love it, man. I, you know, I could only dream of like going to the movie theater and see. Based on a comic book by Sheldon Allen and Mauricio Capitello. Although it would probably be in the end credits buried right before the music. So that's the way to see the do it these <laughs> days when it comes to comic creators. Yeah. I have to like tell like my girlfriend, I'm like, wait, 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 we gotta stay for the credits. Like we gotta wait to see my day. But uh, <laughs> yeah, of course, of course I would love that. But um, you know, when I sit down to write a comic, I it's for a comic, you know what I mean? I, I never really write it with the idea of it being a TV show. Although Snatch, I'm not going to lie to you, I did initially start it as a teleplay, as a, as, a, as a TV pilot. But I was like, you know, I think this would be better as a comic book. Let me start this off as a comic book. I asked that in particular about Snatch because it has mm -hmm. that TV show kind of feel to it, in a great way, actually. Mm -hmm. It kind of feels like something you can watch late night. Um, what's the show they used to have on... Um, a FX show. Let's just say the FX show. Uh -huh. It feels dark and gritty, and I, I like the feel of it. And I think that out of most of the stuff I've read in terms of comic books, this one mm -hmm. transfers very well into that TV atmosphere. And I, I think that sort of just speaks about, you know, just the uniqueness of the concept and just, you know, what we're kind of sort of just used to seeing in, in, in a comic book, right? Yeah. Oh, he froze up.
I think he's back. Bam, you're back. Can you hear me? I can hear you good. Oh, man. That is so... Oh, you break it up again. Uh-oh, you froze up again. No, this is not happening. Let me send you a quick chat. Something... I think you're back. Are you back? I hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. I was just typing you froze up again. I have to type the next. Oh, yeah. uh, I apologize. That's really embarrassing. My uh my Wi-Fi went out. I'm actually on my phone now. Oh, that ain't no problem. That's happened to me before. I am fortunate. Uh, <laughs> I live in a pool. Uh, that's embarrassing to me, though. My, my, <laughs> my Wi Fi absolutely is out. I don't know. It was it was storming pretty bad over here today. I don't know if that's related to it or what. Probably. We've had that here the last few days, too. Right. Well, you know, I'm in the same city as you, so. Oh, you're in Miami? I'm in Miami, bro. Oh, shit. We should be talking about that. <laughs> Do you remember where you left off at? Where, I'm trying to think where you cut off at. I was saying about how I think I was saying this is the ultimate compliment. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead and start from there. And I'm gonna just edit all that shit in there. I, I can do that. I'll just ask another question if you want. How about that? That's a good idea. Now I'm trying to think of a yeah. question to ask. <laughs> I got one. Go ahead. We didn't even we didn't even discuss this. So, how did you hook up with Scout Comics? So one of the things I was looking for, for a publisher, of course, you look at all the other larger publishers, but I wanted a publisher that, you know, I could just be a little bit more intimate with. And, and, and one of the attractive things for Scout Comics was that they're a Florida-based publisher, actually. They're actually uh, headquartered in Fort Myers, which is not too far from me down here in uh, Miami. So that was one thing that, that really attracted me to them. And also... I like the way they responded to my first story that I submitted to them, which was Crucified. They enjoyed it. I could tell that they they really read it and um, they they dissected it. So uh, that's why I've been rocking with Scout Comics since then. See, now that I know that you stay in Miami, because I didn't even realize that you stay in Miami. We got to go hang out and get some Cuban coffee. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, bro, we can get that liquid cocaine. <laughs> Facts. People know about that. So... Let me now see you don't open up a whole new thought of ideas that I just came up with that knowing that you you from Miami. You're in Miami. Now my question is this. How much influence has Miami culture had on the book? I think you can find elements of Miami in everything that I write even if it's not based in Miami. My second book, Concrete Jungle, is based in Miami. It's a sci-fi book in Miami. But uh, this book is based in, in, in California. My first book was based all in Miami. Trust me, even from, from this book, just from just from the strip club scenes to, to, to the hair stores, like that is 305 all day. Yes. Miami. That's because it, it just clicked to me like, yeah, that's all Miami culture, like the hair stores, going to get the weave, the hair stores uh -huh. on almost every block in the inner city. That is like pure Can't 305 culture. Can't miss it. The fish shops <laughs> that's next it. to the hair stores. And we're talking about, you know, Colt Rick Ross, we're talking about the real Miami. We're not talking about South Beach now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the real Miami. For those of you who aren't from Miami, it's, it's, Totally different animal than the actual real Miami in, in, in the city, you know, outside of the tourist spots. It's a, it's, it's a different world, believe yeah. me. 
it's a lot like <laughs> the comic book snatch now that I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the other thing about my books too. They're they're pretty wild and, and they're pretty unpredictable. But again, that that that's Miami. You know, you hear all this Florida man stuff and you know, people like to rag on us. And I always tell people we're not from here. Like those stories sound crazy to you, but to us, that's just like Wednesday. You know, yeah. like that's 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 nothing. Yeah, you know, you that, that's Wednesday. You kind of get used to it. Like a, a buddy of mine came down here. I want to say like a month ago. It, it was like one of the few times he was in Miami. He was like, we just he he immediately went to Little Havana. I'm like, and I'm like, yeah, this spot is amazing. He was at a cigar bar, sat with him and stuff like that. He was like, this just uh-huh. a cool environment. I'm like, this is Miami. <laughs> People do this uh-huh. on a regular basis here. Just sit in cigar bars and smoke cigars and drink Cuban coffee. That's just Miami culture. That's and the other side of Miami culture is them streets, <laughs> like <laughs> them goons that's become out there. And handle their business like you know that's all part of people see South Beach and think that's Miami. That's not Miami. That is what people think they want you to believe Miami is. There's a whole other side of Miami that people don't talk about. The way I try to explain it, well, the, the way I try to explain it is that listen, South Beach is like it's like Disney World to us. Like those of us who live down here, like yeah. we're not going to South Beach. But like at a certain age, like when somebody comes to visit us, they're like, we want to go to South Beach. You know, with me, I'm like, okay, have fun. You know, yeah, enjoy yourself. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going down there. That's just like a whole different aspect. That's like the Hollywood aspect of, of, of what Miami is. So, you know, Miami, I, I I love it for for better or for worse. I love I, you know I love it. It's not, it's nowhere near perfect. It's got a, a, a ton of issues, but you know what? This is my home. You know this is where I was born. This is where I was raised, and you know I've been here ever since. I I don't really have much attention on leaving. So yeah, likewise. I grew up in Miami. Grew up in Liberty City. <laughs> went to Miami. What high, what, what high school you went to? Miami Jackson. Okay, okay. I went to I went to American City. Ah. I don't want to say what I'm going to say. <laughs> no, nah, you can say it, but oh, I, 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 I pretty would, much figure out. What, I, I kind of know what you're going to say, but that's just no, all there, was, there was some bad ones out of the America. <laughs> Trust when, me. When, 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 when I was in high school, it was a common occurrence for some of us brothers to go sneak out to go to America. <laughs> America is top five for that. Trust me. America yeah. see it. We know for that. Yeah. <laughs> I believe in that. <laughs> But I, I don't want to get you in too much trouble with, with your ladies, so you can move on from that one. Definitely. <laughs> so let me ask you this. What are your plans for the future? Are we going to get, well, we know we're getting more snatch. Are we getting other projects? Like you said, you had Concrete Jungle, which is sci-fi. Do you have a, any other things in mind that you're going to work on that may be pushing the boundaries of what you're doing? Uh, after Snatch this volume, we're going to do Concrete Jungle Volume 2. And then, no, not Concrete Jungle Volume 2. We're going to do Crucified Volume 2. Okay. Then we're going to probably do Concrete Jungle Volume 2. And then I've got a couple of original books as well that are, uh, one of them is actually done. Um, I don't want to release them just yet because they're kind of controversial subject matter, uh, even for me by my standards. So I want to build a little bit of a base first before I put those out. Um, but now yeah, I, I got a couple of this is. books coming out. Of that. Now I need to hear what this is. We, we can say it offline. But I need to hear what this yeah. is. No, nah, yeah, definitely. I, I, I'll tell you offline for sure. All right, cool, cool. I'm so, not, I, I'll even show. You, I, I, I'll even just, just, just cause you from Miami. I actually even send you the first issue. My man, that's what I'm talking about. Three hundred five. Home team, baby. Yeah. So, let them know where to find you at, for those who don't know. So, again, you can find me at Sheldon Wrote It, all social media, Twitter, Instagram. I'm mostly on Twitter, though. Um, please follow me. Uh, I would love you if you follow me forever. Uh, at Sheldon Wrote It, you can ask me anything. I'm pretty responsive. I'm pretty receptive. Uh, I'm pretty nice. I don't really think I'm mean or off-putting, and I'm pretty respectful as well. So please follow me. 
um, and, and just drop me a line anytime, man. I'm more than happy to speak to you. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Um, yeah, just, just, just seek me out. Look, you got to support Sheldon. 305, Dade County, Wade County. Got to support our people, man. So appreciate sure. it, man. Appreciate it. Definitely. You said no Wade County. Wait, this is this, this a Miami question. Before we get out of here, I'm gonna leave. This is a Miami question. Let me ask you a question now. You ready? Okay, I'm ready. Who was more influential sports figure in Miami? Dan Marino, Dwayne Wade. Whoo, that's a hard question. Miami people are gonna be mad at me because I'm gonna go D Wade because D Wade brought championships. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it, 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 it's tough, bro. I, I think I got to go with D-Wade, too, though, man. Yeah. Dan Marino ain't bring no rings. D-Wade did. Like, and the, the last time Dolphins won a championship, like, I wasn't born. <laughs> like, I was, I was, that was, what, 72, 74? Yeah, trust me, neither of those born, man. That, that was, you know, the bell bottoms in, in, in Afro days. Yeah, I was around for all of D-Wade championships. I was around for the... You get more much into it. I was around for the Tim Hardaway Heat playoff runs <laughs> with Thunder Dan Marley. <laughs> like, oh. That was when Riley first guy. Yeah, I, I think I got to go with D-Wade, too. I rock with D-Wade. Yeah, man, definitely. This has been a blast, brother. You're always welcome back on. I'm going to tr- – I got an idea. I feel like – I can say this on the podcast. When this episode comes out, Follow Sheldon, and you should already be following me, but follow Sheldon. Sh- shoot me and make sure you shoot me a line, say that you're following Sheldon and stuff like that. We're going to do a little cut giveaway. I'm going to give away an issue of Snatch. I think that would be a good idea. Give away an issue of Snatch. I would actually even sign it if you need me to. Now that I know, you know, we both live in the same town, I can just meet up somewhere and I drop it off for you. Oh, that's perfect. Then, then, there we go. Then, that's a deal. I'll get away issue of snacks when this comes out. So if you're listening to this episode right now, follow Sheldon, retweet the link for this episode, hit me up, show me that you follow Sheldon, and you'll be entered in the giveaway to give away issue of snacks. Bam, there we go. Done. Sheldon froze up again. I did not freeze up again. Please tell me I did not freeze up. Yes, you did. But we're going to close it out right now. So, shoot, anything else you got to want to say before we go? Uh, shoot, I don't think you can say anything. Nah, I think that was my... All right, then, Sheldon. Thank you for coming on, brother. As always, Delvin Cox Experience, we are out. Peace.